my dearest brothers and sisters, as we take a look today at the first reading that Stephen read so well about the prophet uh, Jeremiah, we see an interesting soul here. When, when Jeremiah was first called by God to be a prophet, he may have been as young as 18 or 19 years old. And he was a bit reluctant uh, to do that because of his youth, and he told the Lord so. But the Lord told him, like, listen, you don't really have to worry. I'm going to be with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to make you like a, a bronze wall and an iron pole. And as you know, being part of the Polish National Catholic Church, many of us poles are made of iron. <laughs> well, here we find in chapter 20, Jeremiah shackled to a wall because he had been prophesying about destruction and violence against Israel and the people were rejecting it left and right. And they got to the point where he irritated and upset them so much that he was beaten and, and locked up. And here he is locked up after have been being rejected many times over, constantly mocked, rebuked, beaten now, as we, as we just said. And he's, he's thinking to himself, like, this isn't what I signed up for. You know, when, when God, you enticed me to be a prophet. You enticed me. And I gave in, and I did this. And Jeremiah wasn't expecting these kinds of results to occur. Because he thought that God was going to be with him, and he was going to have all this strength, and nothing could touch him. He was impenetrable, and uh, that just wasn't the case. So what we end up seeing is, a, is a, just a really disillusioned Jeremiah in the moment who's basically ready to quit. What did I do? I'm done. Here's my walking papers. I've had it. And then he realizes the one thing that's going to truly compel him to keep going and that is the word of God. And he speaks about the word that makes his bones burn, that burning word of God within him that compels him that no matter, even though he's feeling this way about all of it, that he's still gonna continue. In this struggle and in this suffering. And that leads us to, to think about our, our own lives a bit, about where when we become Christians, when we, when we accept God and as our Lord, Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we become baptized and we enter into Christ's church, and then we say, I'm a Christian, there's almost an expectation that God is going to protect us somehow. Last week, I spoke about how people really have the audacity to think that God owes them something. But here, it, it's akin to that in which we believe our problems aren't going to become huge because we have faith and because God will protect us and, and all of those things that we, that we believe and tell one another. God never said that he was going to protect you from all the circumstances of the world. He never, ever said that. When he talked to Jeremiah about becoming a, a bronze wall like that and an iron pole, it was to give him strength so that he could go through the suffering that was going to take place later. And this is what's happening. So it is that word of God that actually strengthens Jeremiah to go through the beatings and his imprisonment and all of the above. 
I've preached this many times about what it means to become a Christian, what it means to accept Christ as your savior, to follow him. Because the only two promises that he makes to us, and you can look throughout all of scripture, basically the only two promises that come from Jesus ultimately are suffering and glory. Life is a struggle for everyone. No matter who you look at, no matter if you think, oh, they got their life so easy, they got it made, all of the above, that's just not true. Everyone has their struggles. Some are different than others, but a lot of people weigh their material and physical struggles against others that don't seem to have those. But trust me, they have enough of their own struggles, even those that are in great monetary shape. And we sort of just say, well, my struggles supersede theirs. So I need God more than they do. And I, I expect uh, you know, God to help me and, and, and somehow protect me from these gigantic problems that are, that are now part of my life. And then when we don't receive it, we act like Jeremiah did in the stockade. We just go, what did I sign up for? God, if I just, you know, I submitted my life to you and this is what I get in return? This isn't what I, this isn't what I expected. And also many times I preached about how Jesus spoke about John the Baptist as of all those who were born of women, there was none greater than him. These are the words of Christ. And what was the, what was the, reward, the reward John the Baptist got? I told you many times, he was, he was beheaded for his faith. Talk about suffering, imprisoned and beheaded. That was his earthly reward. That's the problem when we think about God's favor in our lives and what we believe God is going to do for us. There are preachers out there that preach this prosperity gospel, that if you just believe enough, you're gonna get that raise, you're gonna get that promotion, you're gonna get that job, you're gonna have a, a windfall in some way, God's gonna favor you in some way. All you gotta do is have enough faith. And usually what's said if things don't go your way, you gotta hang in there and still have that faith and it'll be there. And then if it still doesn't happen, well, maybe you don't have enough faith. You need more faith for all of that. What are people putting their faith into? Earthly prosperity. That God is gonna financially and physically reward you somehow for your faith. And they go around thinking that, okay, ask anything in my name and it'll be done for you. We think about that, that Jesus said that. And then we have this expectation that we're gonna have this prosperity. But here's the thing, what are you asking for in Jesus's name? What should you be asking for in Jesus's name? The only thing that I really truly expect for people and hope for in Jesus's name above all else is their salvation, their heavenly reward. Sure, I pray that the Lord will ease the suffering of those that are in that way here on earth. Absolutely, why? Because I love God and I love humanity and that's what I pray for. Unceasingly, I pray for the relief of suffering of people. Breaks my heart to see it. I try to do what I can to help alleviate it. But God never said, I will do that for you time and time again. No, he chooses when and if and how much. My job is to pray and my job is to go through my own suffering and stay faithful. That's what I try to emulate and try to lead with that example. But here's the thing, for me, it's the same as it was for Jeremiah, the word of God. So no matter what the suffering is, 
The word of God is there. It burns in my bones too. It burns in my heart. The word of God compels me to continue because just like Jeremiah, there have been times, trust me, in all preachers' lives, there have been times where we have woken up one day and said, what are we doing? What am I doing? I didn't sign up for this. Really? This is what I gotta go through? Oh my goodness. And I can make a list, a hundred reasons. Easy. Valid reasons why I should just forget it and just move on to something else. But I can't because the word of God burns in me. The word of God is above all else. That word of God is Jesus. He is the word of God. and He burns within my heart. So no matter how many times I might whine or complain and, and say I didn't sign up for this and I was hoping for something different and things didn't turn out the way that I want, I still got Jesus who helps make, get me through it all, no matter what it is. And one day he'll help me get through death. So really, what is my true complaint? If I know with assurance that the blood of Christ is my salvation, and I know with assurance that one day I'm going to be resurrected when Jesus comes back with his angels, as he says in today's gospel. If I have assurance in this and I truly believe in it, what are my worries? Truly. Because how long is this life compared to eternity? You know, Paul said that the sufferings of this world are nothing in comparison to the glory to be revealed when Christ returns. But it doesn't mean that I don't ache over suffering. I don't ache over the suffering of others, but I keep it in its place because I know the truth of God and what will take place one day. And that's where my eyes are focused. That's where my heart is set. You know, some people say, because we're like this, well, not because we're like this, but they say that you're not as compassionate as you should be for the suffering sometimes. And that's just not true. Because it always is tethered to Christ. So there's always going to be hope. Sure, I'm a citizen of this country. I'm a citizen of this state. I'm a citizen in this city. But that is tethered to and subservient to my true citizenship, which is in heaven, that Scripture tells me. So I'm looking at heaven's citizenship for all of us, hoping for that above all else one day so that no matter who it is that's suffering here, I can bring them hope as well. Now, not everyone's going to accept that. And that's, that's sad because it's the truth that makes it even sadder because people will reject the truth because they, they feel as if they can't see it. They think that if God is truly there and God truly loves them, you're gonna get what you want now. That's no way to go about your faith. That's, that is just not what Christ wants for us. He wants us to be thinking far more into the future than now far more into the future, even up until the time of our death. That future is where our hope is. It's in that future. You know, when you were young, those of you who are young, you thought about your future a lot. You thought about like, all right, I'm going to finish school. I'm going to get a job one day. 
I'm going to make a whole bunch of money. I want to be successful in my future. I might want to have a, a wife or a, or a husband, and I might want to have a family. I'm thinking about my future, maybe get a nice car, a nice house. I'm going to set up a retirement account for my future. And then the next thing you know, you're living in one of the retirement communities down here. And your future has already happened. And what are you thinking about now? Well, I'm thinking about the way things used to be. Oh, yeah, remember when I was young? Oh, it was so nice if I could be young again. Oh, if only I could be young again. Boy, I would have done things differently. Or maybe not. But it's all nostalgia now for people. It's nostalgia. Which is actually a word that's based on sadness. Nostalgia. And then we think about the past and we re reflect upon the past and we live in the past in our own heads once we've arrived at our future. And we've spent a lot of time just missing out on the present. Because right now, as you're watching this, all you have is the present. And is your present secure in Christ? If not, don't wait for the future. Now, choose Jesus now. He's waiting. He has been. Choose him right now. Let everything else become secondary and tertiary. Let Jesus Christ be your primary thought, your primary source, your go-to your primary love above all else. Choose him now. Because what that will do is it won't solve all your other problems, but what it'll do is it'll give you the strength to get through them. And whatever side you come out on the problem, that's so good to good. And everywhere in between, Jesus remains with you. And all you got to do is ask him. He will never say no. God is so great. We're the ones that are making the mistakes, not him. We're the ones that are rejecting each other. He's not rejecting us. We're the ones not helping each other. And he's trying to get us to do that in his name. So I'm hoping that you're hoping. I'm praying that you're praying. And my desire for you is to find some release so that your anxieties dissipate. Your problems will still be there, but they won't overwhelm you to the point where you can't think about God or anything else but the problem. Try to love on one another and help each other with their problems, to lift each other up, because that's how God works through us. He will help you, just like he did Jeremiah. In Christ's name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.